on in. You coming in then? Good morning, and what a show we've got lined up for you today. Former JLS star JB Gill will be here. Yeah. He'll be telling us uh, how he's made the switch from pop charts to property programs. Dipna Anand will be a part of the show. She'll be transporting us to South Asia as she cooks up one of our most popular chicken dishes. The brilliant chef, Mr. Mark Hicks, will be here for the first time. Yeah. He'll be serving up a dish with the freshest catch from the Jurassic Coast. Top forager, yes, Alicia Vasey is back as well. Uh, she's got more tips of free food you can forage this season. And don't miss this week's Little Masterclass. We'll be teaching you all about how to make the best of seasonal rhubarb with a custard and rhubarb tart. But first, uh, my first guest chef in the kitchen, or rather outside in the kitchen, made his name in some of the best Michelin-starred restaurants in the country before setting up shop in the Surrey Hills. It was warmer in the kitchen than he is out here now. It's Mr Tony Tubbin. Hey! <laughs> you all right there, Chief? Yeah, I'm all right. It's a bit chilly. I'm all right, actually. I've I got know, a heater I'm... here. I've got my fire here. Yeah. Yeah, so happy new year to you. And you. New too. year, new beginning, new start. Yeah. What are you going to be cooking for us as well today? Um, today I'm going to be doing a pumpkin, winter pumpkin gnocchi, like right. a vegetarian dish okay. that's on uh, one of the menus. Because you love your vegetables, don't you? That's yeah, the... yeah. And I started to grow a few after last speaking to you last year. I only had an olive tree. Now, I've, now I'm growing a few things now more. Now you grow so. a few things. It's yeah. trial and error, isn't it, it really? Is, I'm yeah. finding that in my garden as well, anyway. <laughs> but my first recipe, in growing my own stuff, oh, I'd love to grow some of these ingredients that I'm going to introduce you to you a little bit later, but I'm going to do a, a sort of variant on a classic salmon gravelax. I think it's just so simple, as this thing. So you can just use three ingredients for this. I'm just going to add to it with the different flavours. We're going to talk about this amazing pepper as well in a second. But, but what is gravelax? First of all, it's a cured salmon. Uh, and to do it is relatively straightforward. Uh, and I use a cure of equal quantities, sugar and 50, salt. 50-50. Uh, I don't know about you, but I use just table salt. You can use sea salt, but you just use table salt. And 50-50 caster sugar and salt. And mix that all together. And that fundamentally is your cure, isn't it, really? You can, you can wet cure this, but I think it's better off being a dry cured as well. So we get this mixture like that. And then, of course, you've got the salmon. Now, you don't have to use a big piece of salmon like this. You can use smaller pieces, individual portions, entirely up to you. But either way, make sure it's nice and thick, because that's where the timing is quite crucial. So you've got a lovely piece of salmon. Now, this has had the pin bone removed and the belly removed. The pin bones are these little bones that sit inside there. And the easiest way to tell whether it's got any in is to run your finger from the top of the fish to the tail. And if you feel a little bone in there, what you want to do is take a little bit of pliers or... A, the wife's know, tweezers are a good one. Wife's tweezers Make are sure good you one. wash them before you put them back there, you yeah? Might, you, they yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> might be a bit of fish bone on it. <laughs> She's plucking her eyebrows out. Uh, but uh, what you want to do with that is you want to pull it in the direction of where the head is, otherwise it splits the fish. So. If there are pin bones in there, just pull it in this direction. But this one from the soup packet is nice and clean as well. So I'm just going to move that to one side because then I'm going to take the cling film side of this because you can do this on a tray, but I, I found it a little bit easier to work with if it's in cling film. So we just grab decent pieces of cling film. So overlap itself over here like that. I mean, you must have done this a million times Loads before. Of times. But so uh, the the um, the salt and sugar mix is going to draw the moisture that's out of the That's the idea. Yeah. That's the, well, that's the cunning plan. That's the idea of the whole thing, uh, like that. And then what we want to do is we want to grab the the sugar and the salt, and just put a little layer over the surface like that, saving about you want about sort of a three quarters left in the bowl for the top side of it. And then I'm going to flavour this. Now, you can flavour it with different little bit of herbs and things like that, but I'm going to use these amazing peppercorns over here. So I've got these red peppercorns. So what I'm going to do is just place them into a bowl. But these are pretty special peppercorns, these ones. And I'm just going to crush them down in a pestle and mortar. Now, you can just use a rolling pin if you haven't got one of these. You can put them in a little blender. But either way... Those little just coffee gonna... grinder things are... Yeah, little coffee grinders. You can... You can... Grind these all down. The smell of these are, are amazing. Just smell that. Oh, God, that is That's amazing. really, really pungent. Uh, yeah, it? and then I'm going to use this to, to sort of flavour this fish as well. So we're going to take some of our peppercorns over the top and then you grab your piece of fish like this, lay it over the top and then grab the rest of the sugar and the salt and you cover it over like that. So... A little bit more of your peppercorns over the top. 
And then we're just going to cover this and leave it in the fridge or outside here. Might freeze, uh, which you'll see see him in a minute. See my bed. Uh, he's out here for much longer. He's already been <laughs> moaning most of the morning. <laughs> but, like, but we just cover this over. And what the cling film does is keep all that moisture in there. Although some of the moisture is going to come out, we keep everything still in there. So we can slide this off and put it onto your tray like that and just leave that either outside with Tony for 12 to 24 hours. I'll let me in then. You won't be here then. <laughs> uh, or in the fridge already. And then this is what we end up with. So you go from that to this. And if I open this up, you'll see what's happening in here. It sort of firms up the fish. There is a little liquor. You can see this liquid starting to come out. That's what we want. It just holds everything in together. So I'll just leave that to one side. Uh, now I'm going to wash this off and pat this dry because what I want to introduce you now is I've been using this pepper. I'm going to use a little bit more for this next bit. Um, but hopefully, um, and I can see him down the line as well, uh, I'm going to introduce to where these peppercorns come from. Um, we're going to go to Scotland, first of all, where we should should be able to speak to uh, Peter Shabika, uh, the co-owner of Bowtree. He should be on the line as well. Welcome to the show, Peter. Thanks very much, James. Nice and, and to I be see here. You're, you're taking the advice. You're warmer inside as well. But uh, tell me, tell me about how this amazing business started, because uh, it's a sort of family-run business as well. Yeah. So the farm's run by my, my brother-in-law and his Khmer family, uh, and uh, they um, he ran an eco-tourist business in Southeast Asia for 25 years, uh, and then he finally decided to settle down. Um, and um, this whole growing region, Kampot, right down in the south of Cambodia, where the peppers grow. In, this region was wiped out by the Khmer Rouge in the 70s. Uh, and uh, and this is, um, it's a renaissance crop uh, that that um, he wanted to be part of the, the regeneration of this growing region. Um, so he bought land uh, in 2015 um, and then um, he phoned me up uh, and said, um, I've bought this farm. I don't know much about business. Uh, is there any chance you'd, You'd help me, uh, and and I did, and it and it's been amazing ever since. So, so tell us because I, I mentioned this to Tony as well. Everybody, there's been a lot of talk over over a decade or two now about salt in this country and the best salt that you can buy and that kind of stuff, but very little attention has been put on pepper. Uh, but when you taste this. Why, how, can, can you just give us a little rundown in terms of what pepper is and how it's produced before we talk about the different varieties and, and everything else? What, what is it? Is it a big tree, yeah, a so, little bush? What is it? So it's a vine, uh, rather like uh, wine. Um, it grows on a vine. Uh, we plant a pole um, about three metres tall and then we plant three, uh, six vines around that and then it grows up that pole and you end up with this very tall, thin, bushy thing. Uh, and then um, when these little spikes appear, these little pepper spikes, and you might get 30, 40 um, fresh green peppercorns on each spike, and then they're harvested. So, so it's, um, it's a vine um, that we harvest annually. And, and you get an immediate harvest from it. So if, if you plant vines to make wine, I think it's two to three years before you get... Your vines are ready for it's you to exactly make wine. It's exactly the same. OK. Yeah, no, it's exactly the same. Um, it needs to go... Through maturation, so so the first few years we're removing flowers that it doesn't um, make berries, and then third year you'll get your berries. Okay, so it's a, quite an investment to start off with. It so, is, yeah. So yeah. tell tell us about obviously when you go around the supermarket, you've got normal black pepper, you've got white pepper, you've got green pepper. What are the processes to get the pepper to where it is from that vine to where we are now? Okay, so what you do, uh, so so in harvest time which is January through to March, um, you'll see um, the green little berries forming on the vine. And then, the, and then when one or two of them turn red, it's time to harvest the green. And then you harvest the green um, and then you lay it out in the sun. Uh, and like a, like a banana, the volatile oils in it will turn it black and then it dries in the sun. And that's your black pepper. Uh, and then we leave a number of the red berries on the vine until they fully mature red and then they're hand picked um very hard to do because it's us against the wildlife and you end up with the beautiful red pepper you're using at the moment uh and then when we're drying the red and it doesn't stay red uh we'll turn it into white so so we'll boil the berry off 
and you'll end up with a seed inside, and that's the white pepper. It is fascinating to have you on because it's, it's one of those produces. We're talking about salt and you rave about salt and bits and pieces of salt from different parts. And Scotland, I love Scottish sea salt. We've, we're, you know, uh, uh, there's blackthorn salt that's up in your neck of the woods as well. I just think it's absolutely amazing. Right. Uh, and it's amazing the difference of salt, where it varies, although yeah. seawater varies from place to place. But what is fantastic is you've got all this range here produced in Cambodia that just... The, the, the... It's amazing. And we use this every single day. So where Everyone. would where would the, the other pepper be, the, the mass pepper? Would that still be from Cambodia? Where, where, would that, where would they have come from? Um, it just comes from very, very large growing regions. So, so, so big growing regions in Vietnam, Brazil, uh, India, um, where it's grown as more of a commodity rather than artisan crop. Um, so, so the world consumption last year of black pepper was uh, 475,000 tonnes. So it's, so it's a massive oh, crop, uh, and it's a lot of peppercorns. If you think our farm grows six tons, uh, so so a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of that global crop. Well, I wish you all the best with it. It is it is amazing, and you haven't been doing it long as well. It's it's an amazing, amazing produce. So I'm just going to finish this off. We've got a dill over the top. I'm not going to put as much as I would do if I was doing a traditional glab yeah. relax because I want the peppercorns to come over here. But I've just taken a little bit of gin and sprinkle that over the top. But also, speaking to somebody who's based in Scotland, a bit of whiskey would work over here yeah. as well. And then all we can do then, slice it, because I know Peter's looking at this going, right, what is he going to be doing my, with my peppercorns? Well, hopefully I've kind of done them justice, really, when you do this. Because when you take this, you can wrap it up again, and then you can actually slice this into thicker slices, not as thick as this, what I'm doing over there, but just to show you what's like inside here. But you can take slices of this as you go. And then what I tend to do is, is just flip up the knife before the bloodline. So you want to just lift that up. So you see the bloodlines underneath that. So you basically pop your knife in, thinly slice, and then just as you get that bloodline, turn the knife up. Perfect, look at that. Like that. You can trim this off afterwards if you wanted to, but slice it through and then lift it up like that. But this has got your beautiful sort of red pepper a little bit of lemon, some classic dill at the end. Well, I think that... Looks amazing. It just, uh, you can cut it thinner slices yeah, as well if you want. stop cutting it. Am I going to get to taste it? Yeah, never mind. I'm going to give you a bit before it freezes. <laughs> 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 but, look, you just take this nice little... I'll just have a little taste to wind him up. And then, this is a little tip. If you're doing wedges of lemon, to stop it spraying on the person next door to you, what you want to do with the wedge of lemon is remove this little pith line. And then when you squeeze it, it all goes, it all goes straight down. perfectly onto the, the gravel axe. And then we have a little bit of watercress. There we go. Touch with it. And we better serve this before Mr Tobin starts to moan anymore. But there we have it. Peter, I would say, next time I'm in the area, I'll come and visit, but it'll be a long time before I get to Cambodia, I think. But uh, I wish you all the best of luck with it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank you. Peter. Cheers. How amazing is that? Oh, but there you have it. Sort of a, a pink, sort of red pepper, sort of mustard, gin, dill, gravel axe. Oh, easy as that. <laughs> There we go, Chef. Oh, thank you very Dive much. Dive into that one. Tell me what you think of that. A bit of lemon juice on the top there. Oh, it's really pungent, but it's not... It's not, it's not, it's not hot, spicy, is it? It's not spicy, is it? No. And it's interesting, it says, are the strongest one and the mild yeah, yeah. one as it oh, comes down. Oh, that's so good. And now the red one's the one to use for that. If we use the black one, it's too strong. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely spot on. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, we are. <laughs> this gentleman here will be cooking for us a little bit later on the show. And I'll be joined in the kitchen by my guest, J.B. Gill, very shortly. But don't go anywhere, guys. After the break, Dipna Anand will be showing us how to make one of the most popular local chicken dishes from northern mm. India. I'll see you after the break. Lovely.
welcome back. And coming up, uh, I'll be teaching you how to make the most of this season's rhubarb in this week's Little Masterclass. And pop star turned farmer, JB Gill, will be dropping by the house very shortly. But before that, I'm here with Mr Tobin, and we thought some of you uh, would look at some of your dishes that you've been Absolutely. cooking at home. We'll all like this bit as well. <laughs> uh, first up, a big well done goes to Leanne Walters for her Biscoff cheesecake. The attention detail to that is superb. Love a bit Great of Great job there, Leanne. I bet you the first thing was eaten was the, the chocolate things off the top. Yeah. Right? There's biscuit things. There's biscuits. There. Or is that, that, that... That's the Biscoff, is it? Yeah, think. it is. Yeah, yeah that's the one, yeah. exactly. Next up, we've got Jen Lucy, who's made mm. a little modern Asian feast. It looks delicious. Looks amazing. How good is that? It looks like a bitch from a book. Brilliant. Yeah. Finally, top marks this week has to go to Harsha, who's taking mm. inspiration from my red cabbage mask class. This is braised red cabbage with fish cakes and a mustard sauce. Uh, now, do keep sending your pictures and videos coming in. We'd love to see what you've been inspired to cook at home. Right, it's time to take another look at her recipe. This one from a good friend of the show, Dipna Anand, who's inviting us into her kitchen as she whips up a classic chicken dish. Enjoy this one. Hi, I'm Dittner. Today, I'm going to cook up a traditional curry chicken. But trust me, it's not one of those curries that's going to take you hours and hours. This is quick, simple, and super easy. Let's start with some vegetable oil in our pan. We're going to go ahead and add some cumin seeds. Now, cumin is going to give this dish a really nice, warm flavor. So we're infusing that oil with that delicious cumin. And once they start to sizzle, or I say talk to you, you know, you're ready for the next spice, coriander. Again, coriander seeds create a lovely, warm flavour to this dish. And as soon as you get that sizzle, you want to go in with some onions. The finer you chop your onions, the smoother your sauce is going to be. Another one of my key secrets in Indian cooking is getting these onions really, really nice and brown and caramelised. So I don't want them see-through. I don't even want them light brown. I want them really, really nice and brown. And then I'm ready for my next step. This should take you about four to five minutes on an intense high heat. This is Indian cooking at its best. And when it's quick and easy, what more do you want? The aroma from the coriander seeds and cumin has filled my kitchen. That's now ready for some ginger and garlic in equal quantity. So it's 50% ginger, 50% garlic. Give that a little mix. And at this point, it will sizzle. That tells you you're doing it the right way. Right, ready for green chilies. Now, in regards to how much chili you put in, it's really dependent on taste. Now, a little secret that I'll let you into. I can't take too much chili, whereas my dad absolutely loves it. So I'm going to keep this medium spicy. These bird's eye finger green chilies can be pretty hot. So that is sizzling really, really well. My onions have cooked perfectly. My ginger garlic is in. Green chilies have gone in. Now my next step is adding tomato. So plum peel tomatoes are perfect. You can use fresh tomatoes or you can use tinned tomatoes, but just make sure they are blended like this. At this point, what you want to do is lower the heat a little. And let's spice up a little more. I'm going to go ahead and add some turmeric for colour. But you now want to go in with a little bit of red chilli. Again, this is going to change the appearance of the sauce, but also give it that chilli kick. So the green chilli is the one that you're going to get on the tip of your tongue. The red chilli is the one that's going to come afterwards. Now, coriander is going to add even more of an earthy and warm taste. We have added coriander seeds. So you've got that whole coriander, which has infused the oil, and now the coriander powder. More earthiness and warmth right through that sauce, which is going to make it divine. Give that a stir. And right about this minute, we also want to go in with the butter. Now, butter is going to give this sauce that creamy, smooth texture and taste. Now, one of the key steps in getting a masala perfect is waiting for the oil and butter to seep out of the edges. Once that's done, you know it's ready for the next step. So for this recipe, you can use chicken breast or you can use chicken thighs. The way we make this at the restaurant is a little bit different to how we do it here because at the restaurant, we cook in bulk for two to 300 people. The taste and flavour, however, is exactly the same. 
So if you see your sauce is a little bit thick, just add a dash of water. Parai chicken is traditionally cooked with capsicums. So I've got a few mixed capsicums here, and all I'm doing is just roughly chopping like this. So a few red peppers, green and yellow. If you don't have a red onion, you can go in with the white onion, that's absolutely fine. Spring onions will do the job too. Let's not forget to stir that chicken. And remember, when you're stirring, you stir from the edge of your saucepan. And if you're stirring through the middle, be really careful because you don't want to break your chicken pieces. The worst thing for me is stringy chicken. I have really clear memories of being taught this dish by dad. And I'm now cooking it in the restaurant kitchen for two to 300 people as much as two to three times a week. The beauty of this dish is the whole vegetables that go in. So peppers, in. You can't have a karai chicken without your whole peppers. Onions actually are optional, but peppers is a must in karai chicken. The word karai actually means a two-handled Indian wok. But what we use a karai for now is more presentation dishes. So at the restaurant, a karai is what we present the dish in. The onions and peppers in this dish literally need no more than two minutes. And it's at this stage that you get your finishing touches in. This is one of my favorite herbs. It's dried fenugreek, full of flavor. And what you want to do is crush it using the palm of your hands as you put it in. It really is a game-changing ingredient. And the beauty of it is it's now readily available in most supermarkets. What you want to also ensure is when you put the fenugreek in, it's towards the end of the cooking making process, so it retains all that flavor. So in this dish, we've added coriander seeds and we've added coriander powder for a nice earthy and warm taste. Although it comes from the same place, fresh coriander gives a dish a really nice zesty taste and lemony fresh flavor. So both, once balanced, create the most perfect flavor. Now this dish is looking absolutely brilliant. One final spice, and actually this one is the king of spice, the garam masala. Now the word garam means a blend of hot spices. This one is my grandfather's recipe with 15 different spices in. My grandfather always said that the garam masala makes all the difference. It can turn a good curry into a brilliant curry. And literally within one to two minutes, that dish is done. How super easy and simple is that to cook? My biggest critic is my dad. He's quite hard to please, but I know he's waiting for this karai chicken. Dad, the food's yeah. ready. Yeah, okay, you come in. Ta-da! Wow, that is colorful. That's really good. Wow. Are you ready to Give taste? Me a spoon. <laughs> You're wearing your best tie. Oh, thanks. <laughs> and your suit. How many? Wait, before you do this, how many suits do you have? I have a few hundred suits. A few hundred, like how many? About two to three hundred. Give me oh. that spoon first. Mmm. He's really hard to impress. This is good. Have I passed then? You have, certainly. Let me try with a little bit of rice in there. Where do you get your suits from? I have a brother in India who send me suits every he's, other week. He's not, one of the best designers in India. He's not really your brother though. He is. He sends me suits all the time. So you made him your brother. And good suits. Well, guys, wow. that is my karai chicken. Dad is impressed. I'm super happy. That's how quick and simple it is. Absolutely yummy. You've got to go and try that one. It's a fabulous place. I don't know whether you've been to their, their place. Brilliant. No, I haven't been there. 
appropriate name. That's if you can get a table, because it's yeah. packed. Absolutely packed. I'll mention your name, they'll get exactly. No, well, trust me, <laughs> you'll join the queue. If you mention my name, you'll be right in the back, because that's where I was, to be honest with you. Uh, still to come, we've got a recipe from Chef Mark Hicks, and top forager Alicia Vasey will be making her debut, her first appearance on the show in 2023. Uh, but I'll see you back here in a couple of minutes where we're making an epic deep-fried chicken satay, which is right up your street as well. Oh, love I'll that. be cooking that for JB Gill. I'll see you after the break. Welcome back. Uh, now, coming up, uh, Chef Mark Hicks will be sharing a recipe for his smoked fish kedgeri, and Alicia Vasey will be here with some more top foraging tips. But first, I'm here with a man who rose to fame with the multi-million selling band JLS before becoming the host of one of the TV's favourite property shows. It's JB Gill! <laughs> Cheers, 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 cheers. You're not James. on the wine. I'm you're not on, on the wine. You're, what are you on? Tea? Yes. Like that. <laughs> That's the difference between you and I, isn't it, really? <laughs> Thanks for having me. Well, it's a pleasure, because I remember last time, you, last time I saw you, you were here, we talked about the farm and everything else. You've done a total lifestyle, James. Yeah. How's that going? Yeah, good. You know what? It's nice. Obviously, back then, I don't think I'd had any kids. Yeah. So, of course, now I've got but <laughs> two kids, and they absolutely love it as well. Like yeah. My daughter, uh, we were just talking a bit earlier, and, and unfortunately, we lost our chickens to the fox, which happens a lot. Hence the reason I'm going to wind up your daughter even more, because I'm going to do chicken, <laughs> chicken satay for you. Well, she doesn't mind, but, you know, they, they're her thing. Like, she loves going out there, feeding them, you know, making sure they're all right, like, checking yeah. everything, getting the eggs, you know, and it's, it's like you say, it's been the whole complete lifestyle change It is us. a great lifestyle. I mean, I yeah. love the countryside, as everybody knows watching this, I love the countryside. But it is an amazing... From the from your job that you had before, that travelling around all over the place, all over the world, yeah. it, it's it's a perfect relaxation for you, isn't it? Well, that's exactly it. For me, it's kind of the best of both. Obviously, still do quite a lot of travelling, still do stuff with the boys, obviously do a lot of TV bits and pieces, but when I do have time at home, it's so nice. It's that switch off, isn't it, yeah, really, more yeah. than anything else? So I thought I'd do, uh, I thought I'd do some chicken. Uh, not your chickens, because you have not <laughs> any. Uh, I did ask. Uh, but we're going to do this ch chicken satay, and for that I'm going to use chicken thighs. And, and very simply, we're going to take these chicken thighs and deep fry them. I'm just going to take the, the chicken and we're just going to deep fry these, because they're going to take about sort of five minutes to cook. But they're going to go in there. So you'd mentioned they're travelling. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, we, we, we've seen recently you've been involved in this, this property shop. How did that come about? Well, I mean, I guess it's not what you know, but who you know. <laughs> um, no, I mean, obviously, I do a lot of work with Channel 5, um, and I have done over the years with Springtime on the Farm and all the On the Farm series and so on. And I've always been interested in property and, you know, love property, of course, with the yeah. farm and other bits and pieces as well. Um, you know, they were quite interested in having me come down um, and we did a taster uh, sort of tape that like, went, went in one day and, and all got together myself Amanda well, three Lamb. Of you. Yeah, yeah three of us and myself Amanda Lamb and Sam Pinkham and it we just hit off hit it off had you worked together before in no. different different areas no no so I mean I have a similar agent to Amanda right. so that helped but um but yeah I mean I think it's just I mean if you've seen the show as well the yeah. way that we are with each other is is so natural and it, it's almost against the book because we're so very different. So those people who haven't seen this show, I don't wonder where you've been, because you've just... It's been commissioned <laughs> for a thousand episodes, or how many episodes <laughs> are you going to be doing? T tell us the basis of it, then, because this is something slightly different. Tell yeah, us so, the basis of your show. So, basically, it is something that you can... If you're into property and if you're into travelling, you can watch this show, but the best thing about it is that you can take it back home with you. So we go and visit holiday homes, and, effectively, you'll... you'll We'll vote that, you know, out of 10. So I'll give it a mark out of 10, Sam will give it a mark out of 10, and Amanda will give it a mark out of 10. And long and short of it is one of the properties wins on the day. However, these are all holiday homes that people can go and can visit. You know, they can go and look online, and, you know, they're all people who, you know, obviously we've approved them and, you know, gone and checked everything out. And people can go and, and visit them on their holidays. And give us the, some of the places where you've fallen in love with that you hadn't been before. Where are some of the places that you've just gone, I've never been before, I've always wanted to go, but this is, this is a place that I'm genuinely in love. Well, Italy... I mean, I've been to Italy, but, I mean, I'd walked onto the shores. I did a, a cruise show ages ago, um, and I never really got to explore it. And Italy was always on the list of some one of the places that I wanted to really get stuck into. And this year, or last year, um, I was actually able to do that properly. So we went all along the Amalfi Coast. That's not um, a bad area, is it, really? It's a great area to start, isn't it? You've got to time <laughs> it right, though, on the Amalfi Coast, because, you know, otherwise you spend most of your two-week holiday sat in traffic. 
Oh, it's unbelievable. Yeah, or, or you do it via via a, a moped, which is which is one of the most lethal, lethal sports you'll ever do in the mountains. Literally. I remember doing that. It's, pretty, <laughs> it's an amazing part of the world, isn't it's it? It's a beautiful part of the world. Like you say, I mean, to be fair, we even look at some unusual holiday homes like a boat. And even here in the UK, because a lot of the shows that we did in the 80 um, are based here in the UK as well. So it wasn't all just jet setting. <laughs> Not just all just jet setting. <laughs> uh, just those people who haven't seen it, this is, this is where we often get sent clips for, 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 to show on the programme, but I think your production team have stitched you up on this, because oh, you I haven't know, seen this clip, I, I don't, don't think. But <laughs> apologies, but they're, they're not even going to send their apologies, but check, just check this out. I've decided to plunk myself in the hot tub to appreciate the location. For me, this property has super outside space and spectacular views. I kind of knew I'd lose Amanda on the hot tub, but, you know, look at that. That backdrop is what it's all about. I just need Sam to bring us a martini now. <laughs> it's a hard life, isn't it, that? It's a very hard life. Uh, just going to recap what we've got here. So we've got our sauce. This is our satay sauce. You can, you can thin this down. We can add a little bit more of this. Uh, this is a little bit of vinegar. You can add a little bit more soy. You can add a touch of water. Just thin this down a little bit more. But that is your sort of satay sauce sort of done. And then the, the corn itself, you just sort of flash fry it. So this is a little salad. So you want to get make sure the pan's nice and hot. And you can add things like this. Is, this is a little bit of Chinese leaf, which is amazing sort of stuff as well. Um, that, you can add a little bit of cucumber as well, because this, when you char cucumber, also tastes amazing. You can pop that in there as well, but you can just chop this all up. And the idea is you just show it the heat of the pan, because I don't know why I'm showing you. You should be here. In fact, you're going to be here for the, <laughs> you're for the, here for the next cook, because you've, do, you've done cooking on TV as well before. Oh, I love cooking. Honestly, Quite an accomplished well chef, I, I, I see. Well, I mean, do you know what? I mean, I try... I, the thing for me is I probably couldn't deal with the pressure that most of your kish, kitchens work under, but yeah. I really enjoy the process of cooking. For me, it's really therapeutic. So it's, yeah. You don't fancy taking over a Saturday morning and giving me a weekend off every now and then, <laughs> do you? <laughs> I'll get my people to speak to your people. Oh, <laughs> uh, so just quickly, we're just going to then just quickly fry this. And you get, and you, you can char this at the same time. So you've got all these ingredients go in, mm. like that. And then the dressing is done out of a little bit of maple syrup and uh, a little bit of lime. That's all it is, really. So salt and pepper. You can put a little bit of chilli over the top as well. That kind of stuff. But do you, with all the stuff that you're doing now, I mean, you did the... the I mean, when you, when you got back together in JLS, yeah. you kind of imagine that would have been as popular as it was, because it was like 350,000 people that came to your tour, wasn't it? Honestly, we that were blown have been away. amazing. We were blown away. I think when we initially thought about doing the tour, we were looking at about 12 to 15 dates, which is a, a decent tour, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But I think we ended up doing close to 30 in, in total. And that was obviously post-pandemic as well. Yeah. You know, so it, it was an incredible response and we had a great time. And one of the best things about it was that the first time around, for me, there weren't any children. <laughs> and obviously my kids got to actually experience everything. They got to be I in guess the, they in the didn't venues. know Dad... No. Yeah. Um... They'd seen bits. Right. But it's, it, I think it's very different when, you know... And plus it was their first show, like their first you know, arena show, going to see someone live. So for them to be able to come and watch us and be a part of that whole process was amazing. Super special. I mean, it must have been very... I mean, and also, you know, the amount and the volume of people as well like that must have yeah. been fantastic. Yeah, it, is, do you it, know what? is it something... When, you, when you've had the success like that, cos you've sold 10 million records, just throwing it out there, about 10 million records? Yeah, 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 right? something like that. When you, when you, when you have that conversation, you want to give it all up, a lot of people think, why? What? Why? What, what, why? Yeah. Well, the, th the reason is, why is we did... it just did, naturally comes to an end, or...? I think when you're in a group, it's very different. And we've got a great relationship. We still do. You know, I speak to all the boys. We hang out together and individually as well. You know, we'll go to birthday parties and family events and all that sort of stuff. But I think creatively and in terms of your career as well, like, you, you get to a stage, especially when you start quite young. We were, think, tw I think I was 20 when I first started working with them. So I've yeah. always worked with them. Yeah. And actually, you want to, in, you know, you want to discover things for yourself. And, you know, for me, it's all about... Well, it, had, it was initially all about trying to, you know, experience individual things and start a family and, you know, do all that sort of stuff. And do something different as well. Yeah. And so now we, we've got... It looks like top process. of the pops around you, so I'm moving around. <laughs> You've got, you got steam coming off you as well. Yeah, it's all good. But, yeah, now we've got to the stage where... It's a, it's a choice for us to do it, and we love doing it anyway. You know, there was never a, a point where we hated it or anything like that. 
Um, you know, and it's great, as I say, the kids get to experience it, we get to work together. And you get to experience all manner of different sort of stuff, presenting as well while you're doing it as well. Yeah. Look, but we'd look, we just got on here, this is your little salsa that we've got in here. So this is flavoured with maple syrup, uh, you've got a little bit of um, lime in there as well. And we just take this, and this is kind of like your, the, the bed of what's about to happen, mm. which is over here. So I've got my chicken, like that. And then what you want to do is warm up this sauce, like that. So we're going to warm this up. And then this is your sort of satay sort of sauce, sauce that goes with it. So lime I'm going to serve with it, but you can get it lovely and like this. You get, serve it nice and warm, because obviously you've got the chicken. And we just take this, pop it into the chicken. I can smell that salad, it's so good. Oh, I tell you. And then we're going to take this, just serve that on here. And then we roll that all in there. There's silence in the room. Look at this. <laughs> silence in the room. And then I'm just going to chunk... Because I, I, I like food. Like, you know, you're the same, I think. Food like this, you just got to... We've got these chefs that are going to put piles and bits and pieces in there. Just pile it up like that. Mm. And then a little bit, of, little bit of onion. Raw red onion. <laughs> never lost it, never had it in the first place, a lot of people will be saying. Still and then, is. No, I don't. Uh, mint and coriander. So, mint, fresh mint, fresh coriander. You can put things like pistachio nuts with it if you wanted to, but yeah. mint, coriander, a couple of wedges of lime on the side. And that is a decent plate of food. And that is my version of a chicken satay. Done. Amazing. <laughs> I'll just squeeze the lime over the top, and this is where you can dive in Wonderful. and taste. And before I give it to you, I'm going to nick a piece, if that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I know it must be good then. No, I'm going to nick a piece. <laughs> Tell me what you think oh, of that. I can smell it. With the lime and... I can smell it. I love this. A bit of corn. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. It's nice, isn't it? The chicken's good. I like mm. it. There you go. Happy. What a happy customer. Very happy. Right, join us again for the second course for JB a little bit later on this morning. We'll be doing an amazing dish. Macaroni cheese, fully loaded with our bro smokies. And Tony Tobin will be firing at the hobs very shortly, but join us again after the break when the legendary chef, Mr Mark Hicks, will be making a classic kedgeri dish. I'll see you after the break. Welcome back. I'll be showcasing how to make a delicious dessert with rhubarb in this week's Diddle Masterclass. But first, I'm here with Chef Tony Tobin and top forager Alicia Vasey. And together we're about to enjoy a dish from a man who has been a giant of the restaurant food scene. It's a fabulous first time on the show. Mark Hicks! <laughs> Great to have on the show, Chef. Great to have on the show. Yes. And, and it's been a while. It's been a while. It's been, been a long while. It's the first time you've been here as well. So what are you going to be doing for us? So we're going to make a kedgeree with a... Well, when I say with a bit of a twist, I mean, kedgeries for me are often quite dry and sort of like a bit of like a sort of fried rice type thing. Right. So I, I, I tend to serve the rice and the sauce separately so that you can oh, kind right. of mix it up yourself. OK. So the rice is the first bit. You want to yeah, get that so on. that's been um, soaked and washed a bit, get rid of the excess starch. So that's just long grain rice? Uh, basmati. Yep. Yeah, keep it in the Indian tradition. Right. I'll lose that for you. Yep. There you go. Good. And we've got right. some milk there, and we've got some of my... Now, t palette. tell me about this. I mean, you're a keen fisherman at heart as well, aren't you? I am. I am. Yeah. I'm, uh, I fish a lot with your old boss. Exactly, <laughs> my old boss. So, t <laughs> tell, me, tell me about, you know, your time in London, because your time in London, you, you had, what, a good 17 years at...? at yeah, so... Uh, Caprice and the Ivy? Yep, Caprice, Ivy, Sheikis. So this was, Scots. Caprice was first. People think of the Ivy been this yep. icon of the gastronomic world. But you, you were the first chef, that, the head chef of the entire thing. But, yeah, but, exactly. But before that, before the Ivy... Yeah, so before that, I was working in a little restaurant in the city called the Candlewick Restaurant. 
And then the job at the Caprice come up. I didn't really know much about the Caprice right. then. Uh, got interviewed about six or seven times by Chris and Jeremy. It's now, like... you said you're throwing Chris and Jeremy, you're talking about restaurateurs. These are the, probably the greatest restaurateurs in the are. world. They are, yeah. Wow. They're, um, you know, they've recently been through tough times, but I think as far as restaurateurs go... They are the greatest, yeah, yeah, the without best. a shadow of a doubt. Yeah, yeah. And you started there, and then, then how did... So the, the, was the IV a progression from that? Uh, well, them looking at a different sort of another yeah, site. Yeah, so they did the Caprice, did the Ivy, then they sold just as they were opening Jay Sheiky. Yeah. By that time, I was kind of thinking about after 17 years doing my own thing. But you were a bit, a bit like they were doing the open the iconic ones. Yeah, you at that time yeah. was open these amazing. It was almost every year or every two years yeah. you had this amazing iconic different idea that you were opening up in in london yeah i did it and i you know looking back on it everyone says to me now would you would you do the same now as you did then and i, I would have probably done it a bit slower you know based down in dorset tell us what you because you had this thing you still got the fish stall down there you still well got... so yeah so during that time during lockdown yeah you know i didn't have a job didn't have a business i love this idea the fish stall though and uh I decided to look on eBay, my favourite site. I was sat there with a bottle of wine, <laughs> looking at the sea, <laughs> with eBay opened. Yeah. And then uh, this little black Chevrolet van uh, sort of jumped off the page at me. <laughs> got it two days later. So I drove to London, drove the truck back. But, of course, once I got the truck, I wasn't sure what, what gonna I was going to do with it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's all kitted out. It had fridges and cookers in there and all sorts of things. So I, uh, I thought, ah, you know, people can't buy fish because there's no shops open, there's no supermarkets, yeah. no fishmongers open. Um, I'm mates with all the local fishermen. So I thought to myself, you know, why don't I just, you know, buy the fish from them? I love this. Support yeah. them. Oh, that's great. So that I can then, uh, you know, sell nice fresh fish. And then yeah. I started doing little snacks with the fish trimmings, like little sliders and. That but that's your, what you're brilliant at, though. You are, I mean, they're talking about catering, but there's iconic dishes at, yeah. at the Ivy yeah, that have stood yeah. the test of time that you put on that many years ago. Yeah, and they were all very simple, but sort of classic. But they still are, dishes. still are dishes yeah. to this day. So, yeah. so remind us what you've got in there, okay, then. What, so what spices got, have you got? So we've got the curry spices, we've got uh, fennel, uh, cumin, uh, there's some, a little bit of curry powder, because I, I always find that kedgeree is a quick sort of breakfast dish. Yeah. Do you want uh, this and, milk? And or? curry leaves. Uh, yeah, I mean, we could use some of that milk in well, there. I'll leave that you know, to one side, so if you, if, you need, if you need it, there's a little bit of milk there to one side. All right? Yeah, some curry leaves. And, you know, I said, you, you, I read once in an interview, having, having done what you've done in London, you, you said, I'm never going to go back, that's it. I did. That took exactly two months after I read the article. <laughs> I then wrote another article, are you going back? <laughs> well, so some friends of mine bought... Uh, Another iconic company. Yes, so I've been a member of the Groucho Club for huh. probably the best part of 30 years. Yeah. And my friends, uh, Hazelworth, Ivan and Manuela, bought the Groucho Club last August. And uh, I was kind of, you know, watching everything happen and then waiting for a phone call, almost. Which happened, so I said yes straight away. <laughs> <laughs> kind of watching it and waiting for a phone Yeah, when you're sort of being through what you, you know, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And winters are tough down in Dorset. It's... Do you want to turn that off? Yeah. There you go. It's really sort of, you know, having a job to firstly support yourself and secondly to um, support your business as well. Yeah, exactly. It kind of worked out, you know, really quite nicely for me. So what have uh, you, you've got a little bit of stock in there. You're going to add the cream to this? Yeah, so that's going to boil away and simmer a bit, then we're going to add the cream. OK. And that's the finished sauce out. that you've kind of got over there? Yeah, so it? the sauce kind of ends up looking like this. Yeah, I'll switch to that over and then you can <clears> put that on there. So this has still got all the stuff in it. So what I like to do with the curry to get all those spices and stuff in is blend some of it. So you've still got the texture. Smells amazing. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Now, now we're in for a treat. <laughs> well, you have. So, where did you get your ideas from in terms of food and bits and pieces? Where did where did you fall in the world? <laughs> food? Was that was that your parents that got you into food? Or no, not really. I mean, I was, uh, you know, last year at school, probably like all of us that end up cooking. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been working in the pub, you know. The, 
in the fifth year at school where they're asking you what you want to do for you know, the rest of your life as a career. And uh, it was the first time when boys could do domestic science, as it was called then. Yeah. Uh, so three of us thought, you know, be good, why don't we do domestic science? Because we'll be in a classroom full of girls. <laughs> <laughs> so we turned, we turned up on day one. He's honest. <laughs> yeah. So we turned up on day one and there was three boys and the teacher, because all the girls decided to do metalwork. Right. So the metalwork class <laughs> is... Because <still, laughs> so you, 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 <laughs> you knew you wanted to do domestic science. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we sort of had a laugh for a year. And then it got to the end of the year and... Still didn't know what to do. My dad's friend, uh, who had a restaurant in town in uh, Bridport, said, why don't you send him to catering college? So there we go. Right, so we're going to chop all that lot up. We're nearly, nearly there to finish this, aren't well, we? Well, it's kind of, yeah, we're, we are sort of there, really. I've got some, there's some black pepper there if you want it. Put a bit of that in. You can put a bit of butter in the rice as well if you want, but... We've got a sauce going there, so just... So what's, what's, what's on the menu? What can people look forward to when they come and see you in London again? What, yeah, so... Going to be this kind of food, or...? Yeah, so, cadre is... What I've done for, on the breakfast menu, it's a kind of international breakfast menu. I've got a Japanese oh. ramen noodle broth. Yeah. On there, I've got brick aloof, a toasted crumpet with a fried duck's egg and chanterelles. Yeah. Uh, so it's quite a wide, select, you know, full English, obviously. I like that. It's a cross section of everything, isn't it? Yeah. Really. Yeah. And then on the <clears throat> in the restaurant, uh, bacon chop with poor cockles, uh, mutton chop curry, or deer chop curry. Uh, so you know, so it's a lot of the stuff that I had, you know, done back in the old days. Fish and chips. Do you want to do the other yeah. plate? Because there's the two of one. them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this one. So yeah, just recognisable things: roast chicken for two. You know, so yeah. you serve it with the feet on. Yeah. Like I used to do at the tram shed, uh, and it was, it was it's quite interesting because I sort of two weeks in, uh, I hadn't actually done anything. So I just wanted to get to know everyone and get inside their heads. And members were already saying, you know, oh, it's so much better since you've been here. And I'd said, I've, I've not done anything yet. <laughs> 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 it's just your presence, boss. And I think because you know, it because is. it's a club, yeah, you know, the members feel like it's. It's theirs, which, yeah. it, which it obviously is. It smells delicious, though. Some of the members will eat there probably nearly every day, so yeah. it's their home. Yeah. yeah. You know, they treat it yeah. as... It's so very the, similar. The dining room there is sometimes, or often, a bit like the Ivy used to be, you know, high-powered people doing business in there. So, uh... <laughs> it's a tasty plate of food, isn't it? Yeah, I am right looking forward to this. There we have it. Mark Hicks, everybody! Yes. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, I get a spoon like this to taste. But this is this is. We'll have a we'll have a little taste out of the pan. Why not? I've got to taste this this haddock as well. So what do you what do you do with the you're curing the haddock? When, is there yeah, a special so cure in it, or it's just the salt smoke? and sugar, sea yeah. salt and sugar, and then it's uh, smoked with apple and oak. Oh my god! And you can actually you know you, you can. Eat this raw as well, really. Not raw, but... That is the best you know. kedgeri I've ever had, hands down. And you're saying you can eat this like this? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just the same as smoked salmon, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. You're right as well. I mean, you, yeah, you could serve it just like smoked salmon. You know, imagine having some horseradish on top. Or... Well, no, the horseradish pushing no, it a bit. Um, but... <laughs> yeah. Or some of that mustard mustard stuff you brought, brought with you. That's delicious as well. There we go. It. Mark Hicks, everybody. <laughs> All right, I'll be taking mac and cheese to another level, hopefully, with my guest. Uh, that's JB Gill. Come, that's coming up later on this morning. I'll be showing you how to use rhubarb and to make a stunning classic dessert of a custard and rhubarb tart. That's coming up in this week's Little Masters. But after the break, friend of the show, Alicia Vasey, will be bringing her foraging gear with her and explain to you what you can get right now all around the shores and a little bit inland in the woodland. There we have it as well. She's doing cocktails as well. Cocktail Maestro. I'll see you after the break. <laughs> 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 
Welcome back. Now we're chatting some more to pop star farmer and presenter Jamie Gill later, and I'll be making an epic rhubarb ginger custard tart in this week's Little Masterclass. But first, it's a pleasure to be joined in the house for the first time this year by a Yorkshire lass who's come all the way from the moors near Halifax. <laughs> <laughs> and to share her encyclopedic knowledge on foraging. It's Alicia Vasey! Yay! Mark and Tony are joining us as well, cos I know, Mark, you're a big forager as well. Yeah, it's a part of life down there in Dorset. <laughs> it is a part of life. Tony... It's not part of my on life. On a golf course... There's probably I'm... loads of this on the golf course, but... Well, there was, until they sort of went round with the lawnmower and yeah. cleaned it all up, but... <laughs> you're going to teach us a little bit about stuff that's, that's seasonality-wise that's available at the moment. Oh, yeah, cos it's a tough one. It's a tough one to get greenery at the moment. This is a tough one, So, right? before so you get on right. bits and pieces, I'm going to crack on and do my little rare bit. So, I'm going to do a, 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 a rare bit to go with some of the ingredients that we've got here that you say that will go yep. perfectly well with it. So yeah, perfectly well. Go, go for it. So, first of all, where, where are we going and what are we doing? Right, so, right now, coast yeah. is best time. Funnily enough, the salt water and the sea temperature keeps things a little bit warmer on coast and on salt marshes, so it don't freeze up as much. And we've got some really good things that come through this time of year. Where do you want to start first? Should we start with this? Alexanders? Right, I tell you what. Um, right, we'll do with the Alexanders. Okay, so Alexanders they come from Macedonia, where Alexander was born. So it's, it's we know it as savoury rhubarb in this country, and also it's got like a parsley type taste to it I as well. I never knew that savoury rhubarb. Savoury rhubarb. People used to grow this in the gardens. This went out of fashion. Fashion. This is what everybody would have used in winter back in the day. And what? it was everywhere. This, this has really just gone out of fashion, but really it had all the vitamins and minerals in for winter. So, that's you. That's you. So, when we're doing this, do you can yeah. eat the entire lot? Do you have to yeah, blanch no, it? You could, no, listen, you can eat it raw, you can do that in a salad, you can barbecue the... Um, the actual stalks, when the stalks get bigger, they're even nicer then, just wilt it and do it like a cider company. It is the easiest thing. You're not going to go wrong. You don't need to be frightened of this now, one. Now, there are things that look like this that are not this. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that look like that. You've got to know what... I keep saying, you just... <laughs> 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 yeah. I was saying so... earlier that, yeah, we... we... Yeah. Stick it in Bloody Mary's instead of yeah, yeah. Um, celery. Yeah, and it does look a bit like hemlock as well. Yeah, my lads mm. came back with some hemlock one day. I didn't realise yeah. until halfway before a Sunday yeah. lunch service. Yeah. <laughs> There's customers yeah. sitting there at the bar with hemlock. So if you don't know what you're doing, glasses. right, if you don't know what you're doing with this and you pick the wrong thing, you'll D. It is, it is that deadly. <laughs> look at Tony, he's about to munch on this. Yeah, no, it's all right. <laughs> it's OK. You trust right. me, don't you, James? I do trust you, yeah. Known you a long time. So th there's the hemlock. What, what are we going to? Yet, are <laughs> Not hemlock. <laughs> Not hemlock. <laughs> Change my mind. We've done the hemlock thing. Right, so we're on to cabbage. So there's the, the Alexanders. The, these yes. are the things. So, so where are we yes. going next then? Where are we doing next? Right, we're still on coast. Yes. Yeah, I'm on with cabbage. All right, like a bit of cabbage. All right, so one with right. brassicas. Right, so, um, so these. Right, I'll, I'll just tear a bit off for you. All right, because you, you might like this. Right. OK, so I want you to try... Right. Do you want the man or the mouse portion? The man portion. There you go. What do I do with this? Do... Eat it. Right. Now then, right, I'll just give you... What, what is that? <laughs> Shift over. That's delicious. What is that? <laughs> I love the baby Mark, you know what this is, yeah. What's that? It's like mustardy stuff at the back. Yeah, black mustard. That is black mustard. Look, wait to taste it, wait. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. That grows everywhere. Absolutely everywhere. It doesn't grow in my garden. It is, it is strong, though, isn't it? The aftertaste from it is amazing. It's, it's as strong <coughs> as wasabi. I mean, if you actually eat the stalks, OK, you can use them as dips. Use them as stalks. They, they just pack a Yeah, punch, blend it up. They? It's lovely as a yeah, dip, a bit like wasabi. Right, OK. That's fantastic. Do you want to have right. a go with this one? It's not as bad. Right. You aren't bringing anything like horseradish, have you? Because no, I'm about to throw no, up if no, you do that. I know, no. you, I, know you can't, I know you can't stand that. I won't do that Right, to OK. You. What's this, then? Right. This is sea radish. So this right. is salt mash. Now, you can eat the stalk and the leaves. I'd do a bit of both. Bit of both? Yeah. Sea radish. Sea so, radish. So, where, obviously, the, the key's in right. the name. Right, yep. So we're on the salt marshes. It is all around at the moment. Now, that's nicer. Yeah, it's, it's not as... It's got a kick. A little kick at the end of it. Yeah, but you've got that radish flavour coming through. Yeah. You get that radish straight away, haven't you? Yeah. yeah. Isn't that lovely? I love radish. It's worked to take me straight back to... Yeah. But that, in, but that in a salad at this time of year, right, yeah. and it's free, OK, and you're on now, now you're on the salt marsh. So what you're looking for on a salt marsh, when that grows, and it grows in, like, um... Can we say, before we go down the salt marsh, we've got a bit of... Cheesy stuff. Rare bit. She's going on here. 
Just a little bit of rare bit on top. <laughs> just a little bit of rare bit. <laughs> did we do toast last time? I did toast last time, yeah. Yeah. There's a theme when you come on. Yeah, mushrooms on toast. And we stick by it, yeah, exactly. And then we're just going to put that... <laughs> right, where are we going next then? <laughs> right, well, I'm just telling you about where you get your sea radishes from right. because they like, they're growing like, you know, when they get the dandelions in your garden and they grow in a rosette? Yeah. Right, so you're looking for those on the salt marsh. That is salt marsh. That gets covered in salt water. That's what you're going for, okay? So are these, are these, do these grow in the same places as like sunfire and that kind of stuff? No, no. The... This does, the sea radish does, if it's got the word sea at the front of it, you're usually looking at salt marsh stuff. Okay. But we, we do digress, cos we, uh, we did go to Woods, and I'm going to do you something really nice. Because it's... You've got the mustard, you've got the parsley, you've got the radish. Yeah. Now we're on for the lemon. OK, where are we going right? next, then? So we're off to the wood sorrel. So right at the front, which it looks like four-leaf clover. Yourself? Mark knows what this is. Mm -hmm. I like that Mark knows what this it's is. It's very common. It is very common. And again, right. it's a delicious. I, mean, I think the balance of all those different leaves in the salad yeah. in the winter. That's the. It thing, is actually. It? Yeah, mm. the, 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 the mustard, the a celery, bit of the with that the parsley, one as well, citrusy. Yeah. And that's yeah. what you want to cut through, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's nice. You like that, don't you? Yeah, I like that one. Yeah, yeah. you like that one. And you've got a lot of different types of sorrels, so they'll come under this branch called the oxalis, and um, you can get that, and then you've got... My, mine's, mine is always pink as well. It gets later on in the year, I've got the pink wooded one, you've got the green wooded one, and then you've got this stuff as well, which... This is, again, it cos it's, it's... You know, you've got to be careful where you pick it, because it's that, it's that dog on a path scenario, isn't it? I prefer that one. <clears throat> Back of the net. Right, where are we going next, then? Right, After I'm going to do... These. Well, I'm going to do you a cocktail. Yeah. OK, cos you know I like to give you a drink. I do, yeah. Yeah? Not, so not a strong... You're doing a cocktail out of, out of what we've got here, or...? No, right, so what we're going to do is we're going to do a wood sorrel cocktail. Right. Ooh. Potatoes. Right. So this is potato... Yeah, that's that's made out of King Edward potatoes. Yeah. So I thought we'd do spud and sorrel. What is it, though? Vodka. Oh, it's, it's like Halifax moonshine that you brought down with you. <laughs> 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 it's a bit better than that, right? I'm not going to do it too strong because I'm going to water it down with a bit of prosecco. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not going to be all. All right. I won't point this at you. I'll shake it. Yeah. I won't do that Go. to you, would I? All right. Let's point it somewhere not expensive. There we go. So, okay. Yeah. There you go. Honestly. So what have you got? Just to recap, what have you got in there? Right, so we have got... So what I did, I made some heavy stock syrup and we've just literally blitzed some wood sorrel into it. Yeah. OK. And then a bit of a King Edward. James is going to garnish it now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I brought it on cos you like your spuds, don't you? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I tell you what, you could be a cocktail waiter. How's wouldn't that, you? innit? How's right. that? Yeah, I mean, that's just finesse. It is. That is finesse. Right. Can it help himself, can it? <laughs> yeah. Merlin would here, be proud. He would, wouldn't he? Right, it's all right. <laughs> what the hell's that? Oops. What's that? That's one without a tip top on, but there you go. Yeah. Right, do you that one. <laughs> See, that looks fab. Yeah. So, this is so, like, this so, is like... Right. You've just ruined... I'm having that one, cos I'm just going to get frippery up my nose, aren't I? There you go. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. There you go, guys. Thank you. Right. Got it? Looks great, so, it? so, how have you made the green stuff? You just blended it? <sighs> right, wood what sorrel. Wood sorrel. OK. Wood sorrel, blitzed, bit of stock syrup. Yeah. OK, reduce it down quite well so you've got a heavy syrup. And then what I've done is just put a, a smidgen of vodka in. Right. Uh-huh. And then we've just topped it with a bit of Prosecco. And give us the name of this drink, then. I can't name it. I've just done it. We've not got a name yet. No, I didn't mm. know. Oh, I was going to put it with spud and sorrel vodka. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> Halifax okay. moonshine. How's that? <laughs> That's not right, good. No, really, that's what it? it is. That's what it is. That's there we right. go. Alicia, everybody! Yay. Thank you for coming down. You've got to stick around for the rest of the day. Ooh, good yeah, stuff. Go good on stuff then. as well. Uh, right, Tony will be cooking for us next, and I'll be serving up another dish for my guest, JB Gill, a little bit later. But after the break, I'll be making a seasonal masterclass with rhubarb. Rhubarb from West Yorkshire, from Pudsey. Happy with that? God's own. That's coming up next.
Welcome back. And I'll be treating presenter JB Gill to the ultimate mac and cheese. And chef Mr Tony Tobin will be firing at the hobs. That's coming up next. But first, it's time for this week's Little Masterclass. And now I'm going to show you uh, the only way you'll ever want to make custard tart again. And it's with the humble rhubarb, which is just coming to season right now. We're talking about two to three weeks into the season now. Uh, so we're going to do the custard tart with the rhubarb. So the first thing we do is get on and do our custard. For that, what I need to do is warm up some whipping cream. So you can use double cream, whipping cream or single cream. It's entirely up to you, but we've got some whipping cream over here. Next, the flavour that goes particularly well with rhubarb are things like ginger, orange and whiskey. I'm going to get onto those with a topping as well. But, but for this, I'm just going to use some ginger. And you want sort of a, about an inch and a half of ginger. Now, I actually leave the, the skin on the ginger because you get this lovely warmth from the ginger skin as well. So what we're going to do is just infuse that very similar to how you're doing it with vanilla to get that lovely flavour. So that's part of the custard bit. Next bit, we're going to then line our tart tin and bake this blind. And bake blind means sort of this kind of thing, really. That's what we're looking at achieving. Now, this is not cooked just yet, because I just want to flash this in the oven, because I want to show you a couple of tips of how to get this right. So I'll pop that in there. While that's in there, we'll get to the stage where we can get to that bit. So I've got the pastry, which is butter, flour and egg. You can use a touch of water for this, blend it in a food processor, that's your pastry. So we'll move that to one side. Um, and then what you can do, pop it in the fridge just to rest nicely. And we've got over here. Now, the key to this is try and keep this cold. What you don't want to be doing is rolling this out on a wooden worktop, which is warm. So that's why a lot of chefs will have, pastry chefs will have either stainless steel or marble cold. So when we're doing this and we roll it, we can do this in sort of little bits at a time. So we roll it one way, like that. A little bit of flour, stop it from sticking. Roll it again. Try, wherever possible, keep the shape. And you'll get the shape, if you keep turning it like that, you'll keep getting the shape, but also stop it from sticking underneath. So keep rolling it out like that. Now, you want it as thin as you dare. I say that because the thinner it is, the better, because the pastry is just holding all that lovely filling. You don't want a big lump of pastry in this. And you can see, I'm daring to go a little bit thinner. The temptation with this is to always go thicker because it won't leak. Well, there's a little tip that I'm going to show you to prevent that. So we can take our metal ring now. Now, I like to use these metal rings rather than sort of uh, tart tins, the fluted tins. I just find these a lot easier to take out. You get much more filling in rather than the thinner ones. So have a look at these online. Invest in one of these. They call them moose rings, to be honest. You can buy them from catering suppliers online as well, but you've just got sort of a, a lovely little moose ring there, which you can use for mooses, and, and you can bake with it as well. So make sure your tin doesn't buckle as well in the oven. So get yourself a nice tin. Same sounds daft, but if it's really thin, it buckles, and, of course, your tartlet isn't straight, it ends up being lopsided. So with this, you lift the rolling pin above. Don't press the rolling pin onto the ring, otherwise it'll cut into the pastry. You lift that up like that. And what you want to be doing with this is treating this with sort of kid gloves. If you pull the pastry at this point, it's going to attack itself when it goes in the oven. And what I mean by that, it'll actually go the opposite way. So if you pull the pastry one way, it'll go the other way when it's in the oven, it'll shrink. So what we do is to kind of literally just help it into the corners here. And you want to push it down like that so it all sits in the corner. Now, that's how I would line it. I wouldn't trim it off. Definitely wouldn't trim it off until after it's cooked. Because if you trim it off now, it's just going to collapse in the oven. So get into the habit of trimming it off afterwards. A little bit of greaseproof paper. Now, for this, you can make a cartouche. Circle out the square. Fold it, fold it, fold it, fold it. Measure, you want about two inches bigger than the size of the mould. Open it up like that. Cartouche. Sits in the bottom. Now, a lot of people have baking beans. I don't use baking beans. I just use leftover, probably because I'm from a certain area of the country. Uh, <laughs> don't want to spend 20 quid on some baking beans. I'll just use, I'll use some flour. I use flour or rice. So if you've got any pulses, uh, pulses that are out of date, a rice that's out of date, don't throw it away. You know, have it in a container and use it 
for this, for baking, and just keep using it all the time. So flour, pulses, rice, that kind of stuff, is perfect for this. So fill it up. What we'll do now is pop that in the fridge. Leave it in the fridge, uh, preferably for an hour or two, something like that, and then set the oven 200 degrees and bake it blind, which I'm doing with this one. So you can see in this one, as it comes out, it's starting to cook the pastry. So after about sort of 15 minutes, uh, sort of been in the oven, then I would then just take it out, take the paper out, and you end up with this. But it's quite raw underneath, so keep putting it back in the oven. Now, to prevent it from leaking, that's the key, because this is custard, you take some beaten egg and you brush the pastry with the beaten egg. Now, if you've got a massive great hole in it, one of those mine the gap holes, then you're going to have to plug it in with more pastry. Egg is not going to solve the problem. But then you've got... You see, when you do this hot, it cooks straight on it as well, which is perfect. So we can leave that to one side now, because that's that, that's that bit ready. Meanwhile, over to our custard. We'll get on and do our rhubarb in a second, because our custard is nearly there. We're then going to take eggs. And I want eight egg yolks for this. So we're going to take eight egg yolks. Now, you can use whole eggs if you wanted to. But by using the egg yolks, it makes it lovely and rich and light. Now, obviously, we keep the egg whites, because these freeze. You can use these for a meringue. That kind of stuff. It's brilliant. So that's going to go in there. So, so there we go. That's that. And then I'm going to leave those to one side. And then what we do is just infuse this custard now with some sugar. Now, the temptation is to put the sugar in too early. Put the sugar in now, when the custard's cool, because sugar will actually start to cook the eggs. And you'll notice that if you put it in too early and you get little specks of yellow that you can't get rid of, that's because the sugar has cured the egg. So mix that together. Get yourself a little sieve for the ginger. Pour that over the top. Like that. And mix that together. Now, what you want to do at this point is reduce the temperature of the oven down. So 200 degrees, 400 Fahrenheit to bake it blind. Now, reduce the temperature down to about 135, 140. Now, if you put it in when it's too hot, it's going to souffle up. So to prevent that, we knock the temperature down. And what we want to do is take our custard like that and fill our mould. Now, you see, I'm only filling it two-thirds because I'm going to use the rhubarb to top the rest. And then... If you are doing a custard tart, fill it in the oven. Don't do it like this, but it's only two-thirds full, so it'll be fine with this. And we just take it to the oven, like that. And then you can do, if you want, rather than nutmeg, just top it with a little bit of ginger. Now, I'm going to take a touch of ginger, lift this out. I like to do it when it's in the oven, because otherwise it just keeps it nice and flat. Just a little bit of powdered ginger over the top, rather than being nutmeg. That goes in there. Shut the oven door. About an hour this is going to take, 45 minutes to an hour, something like that. Keep your eye on it, and we end up with what we've got here. It's not been in the fridge, it's just straight out of the fridge. Next, rhubarb. Amazing stuff, rhubarb. Rhubarb is actually not a fruit, it's a vegetable. Botanically, it's a vegetable. Um, but it's an amazing stuff, this. It's absolutely it's one of my favourite, favourite ingredients when it comes into season. So, to prepare it and to cook with it, other flavourings that go really well. I've done rhubarb crumble on this show as well. If you're going to do that, don't cook the rhubarb. Put it in raw, mix it together with the butter and the sugar, put the raw crumble on the top and bake it in the oven. That's the way you make a rhubarb crumble. Not deconstruct it and stuff like that. Do it properly. And then this. This is delicious, this rhubarb. When you cook it like this with something like a clotted cream rice pudding, that kind of stuff, it's wonderful. Rhubarb fool. And then what you're going to do is then you're going to line this up. Now, it's worthwhile you're spending a little bit of time doing this. You're going to spend time anyway, because this is going to take 45 minutes, an hour in the oven to cook. So when you're doing this, line your rhubarb up. And you can line it all up. Now, if everyone was doing rhubarb fool, that kind of stuff, like this, I would generally always do it like this, because I just think, hey, it looks nice. But you want to respect the rhubarb. Because... There we go. You just line them up like this. You can fill up the entire tray if you want. But what you want is enough rhubarb to fill the top of this. So when you're doing it, sort of look how much rhubarb you've got compared with the size of the, the, the tartlet. That's what you want. So you're going, to, you're going to lift this up when it's cooked and place it on the top. Now, we need to put sugar on it. 
This is where the idea of the dip dab comes from, apparently, because instead of licorice, they used to use rhubarb in a bowl of sugar. That was the kid's snack. That's what my granny told me, anyway, when she was alive. A uh, little bit of um, orange. And these are the flavours that go really well with rhubarb. Orange zest, orange juice, like I said, ginger. So you can put some ginger and syrup if you wanted to put in there. You could put some powdered ginger on it as well. But we're just going to pop that over the top. So you've got the sugar, you've got the orange juice. Now, you notice I'm not putting loads of liquid on it. It doesn't need it. That's, that's enough, really. That's all it kind of needs, apart from a little drizzle of whiskey, because this goes brilliantly with rhubarb. So just a touch of whiskey over the top. And then what I do now is just cook it in the same oven, really, if you wanted to. It's going to take a little bit longer. Got the benefit of two ovens over here. So just leave it uncovered, pop it in the oven. This is set about 180, 200, and you can pop this in the oven for about 10 to 15 minutes. Don't overcook it, because we don't want to break it all down. We just want to keep the shape. So about 10 to 15 minutes, pop them in the oven. As soon as it comes out of the oven, cover it over. Cover it over with a bit of cling film. What will happen to this, it'll actually start to steam. If we lift this off, you'll see what I'm talking about. So you can see it retains... Look at that beautiful colour you get from that. But you can see how little juice you get from it as well, because it retains all that flavour. I'm not dissolving the liquor that's in there as well. We want all that juice to be in there. Next, we can take a sharp knife and get rid of this pastry first. So what I'm going to do is cut away from the tartlet. So rather than do it this way, I don't want any of the pastry to fall into the tartlet. So we take a knife and we sort of shave along the top of that mould. This is where I think it's so much easier to do it like this, with the fluted tins. you see what I'm talking about. So cut it through like that. And it'll break off. I'm not blunting though, because it's on the edge. And then you can see it's nicely trimmed off like that. Kids. And then we can grab our little spatula, which we've got in here. And then we can kind of lift this off and start to build this up. So you're going to take your rhubarb like that and place that on. So you can see. Now, if you've got a lot of time on your hands, you can do this and lift them out individually, but I think if you're that kind of person, you need to get out more. <laughs> <laughs> but, do you know what I mean? Just lift it off over the top. And you see you retain all that beautiful colour as well. I'm going to fill in those little gaps in a minute, but I just think it looks lovely like this. But this is your... a variant on rhubarb and custard, of course. Now, as I was saying, this rhubarb like this is cooked. You can then use this for, you know, rhubarb sundaes, that kind of stuff. It's wonderful. It goes well with so many different things. There's rhubarb. Even like a, a posset. If you did like an orange posset, and just served it with this on the top. It's delicious. One of my favourite things, apart from this, is, of course, parking, which I've done on that, uh, on this show before. Parkin's a bit like a sort of a sticky toffee pudding, northern sticky toffee pudding, I suppose. Um, done with oatmeal and bits and pieces, but treacle and, and that. My granny used to have this with dripping cake. That was another one, made with, yet yeah, dripping. But you can sort of, you know, fill in the little gaps now with the little bits of rhubarb. I just think it, it, it's just a... A wonderful way of actually serving rhubarb. Now, you can, if you want, glaze this. You could do that, but I, I don't like tarlets with apricot glazes and stuff like that. I like them absolute natural, really, as they are. And then when you come to then serve it, do this away from your guests and your family, but slide this off. Like that. And then you lift it off. And there you have it. So your classic rhubarb and custard tart. And then when you take a knife and cut it, you can take a piece out 
like that. And by using these, these rings, you see, you don't have that hassle of the metal bit that and you end up losing and you can't use the ring as well, but you just have these little moose rings, which is much easier to use. But there you have your beautiful custard tart with your Louvre rhubarb flavoured with a bit of ginger. There we have it. Job done. Uh, there you go. Uh, now, if there's anything you'd like to learn about, a little mask us and do get in touch. We'll see if we can help out right here on the show. Time now for a quick break, but join me again in a couple of minutes when Chef Tony Tobin will try and top trump this dish. Good luck with that one, mate. Anyway, I'll see you after the break. Welcome back. Now, we're making a show-stopping mac and cheese for my guest, JB Gill, uh, very shortly. But first, I'm here with Mark and Alicia. And we're going to get ready to enjoy a dish from an old friend whose CV includes stints at some of the most critically acclaimed restaurants of the 90s and the noughties. It's Mr Tony Tobin. Yeah. See, it's nice to be doing this because we spent more or less a decade going running around like a complete nutters uh, with carry bags of ingredients. So it's quite nice, isn't it? Just to, just... Well, we kind of know what we're going to cook today. Well, exactly. Kind so what of. are we going to be doing then? OK, so I'm going to make a gnocchi, a little, little dumplings. Yeah. Um, with uh, pumpkin. So you're going to first of all make the gnocchi on and get the yeah. So I've got some the... I've got some stuff I'm going to serve with it. Okay. So we, we want to get a few flavours kind of working together. So we've got here um, two beetroots. I've got the normal kind of purple beetroot. Do you want me to warm this up on a tray? Is that yeah, what you can put some of those onto there. What with the keep, juice? Keep them separately. No juice. Okay. There and this is some um, of the pumpkin which I've confit. I suppose you'd call it. I've cooked it very right. gently in olive oil with garlic and thyme. Completely immersed in olive oil, with garlic okay. and thyme. So we're going to and get... What about that. this? What's this in here? What's that? So these are beetroots, which are baked in salt. Right. OK? Right. Ba baby beetroots. These are called rainbow beetroots. These are just normal beetroots. And then I've made a syrup out of um, vinegar and sugar. Right. And then just sat them in there overnight. So I did all this yesterday while I was thinking about you in my own kitchen at home, you see. So I'm glad you're in the kitchen, not in the bath. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so that's, that's kind of got those uh, in, in the oven to, to warm up. So we're going to make the gnocchi now. Yeah. And that's... We've got some pumpkin um, puree here, which is... The pumpkin's been roasted, yep. scooped out, and then pureed up. You put that into your bowl, and then we're going to... But you're add... a big lover of Italian food, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, I, I, I actually really like Italian food. But I love Italy. I mentioned, I mean, I your, England, I mentioned but... your training. I mean, you were... I remember when I first came across you, the, well, we're talking quite a number of years ago. The, a long time ago. The great Nicola Dennis. Yeah. I mean, you, you were a sort of a, you know, a head chef in, in one of his restaurants, and the, the restaurants that the empire that he was growing in London at the time. It was really an iconic time in mm, time. Yeah, you, were a, you weren't there, but you were in part of the hotel that yeah, yeah. was there as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, uh, you know, Nico had a... a, a, a Fantastic. People had a lot of respect for Nico. Yeah. You know, um, and but he didn't he didn't cook a lot. In fact, I re I rarely saw Nico cook, but he would ask me to cook something. Yeah. And then he'd taste it and then say, that's really nice, but go away and add this and do that. And he, he kind of created his dishes. His palate was amazing. His palate was unbelievable, but I, I became his, his, his hands, if you like, his cooking. And, you know, he wasn't young when I worked for him. I mean, bless him, he's, not, he's definitely not young now. Right, so we've got... Right, so we've got our dough there. Yeah. And it needs to be so it, you can, it comes to a soft... So you can roll it into a soft ball, okay. like this, and it's not sticky. You see that? Now, I've rolled some for you, and then what I want you to do is to roll them with your thumb off that board down into the water, and you'll get that gnocchi shape. Like that. <coughs> so I'm going to drop one in there. You've got to be quick. got to be quick. Yeah, do that quick. Do I've quick. done some already, obviously, just yeah. in case you were no good. <laughs> it's a bit. <laughs> you're, doing, you're doing well. Very well. Um, so these are poached off and then cool down and you see they firm back up because they're I quite I like the idea soft. of the butter pat, using that. Yeah. Because yeah. they use forks, don't they? Yeah. In Italy. Yeah. You, you, yeah, you can. But the butter pat but is easy, James. It's like a, roll it it's easy rolling it off there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, exactly. Really, really easy. But they use olive oil when they should be using butter in Italy, don't they? We all know that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to and add... And how long do you blanch these for? You, you blanch them. Until they float. So if you turn yeah. that water up a little bit, as yeah. soon as they come to the surface, they're ready, they're cooked. Okay. And then just spoon them out. Ice-cold water or something like that? 
Yeah, put them into ice cold water. I don't actually, I just let mine cool down. Okay. The steam right. down, because I don't want them to get too soggy. I'm just going to okay. add. I'll put them over there. And then, well, put, I'll keep them going over there. And then you want to fry these in butter, don't you? The, these ones. So a little bit of that. Yes, yeah, some butter in there. Yeah. Well, you turn, yeah. That's I just right. turned it up a bit. Now, tell me about what you're up to now, anyway, because the, you, you, had a, you had a restaurant, the dining room, when, when, when in the days of Ready, Steady, Cook. Yeah, well, I lost the dining room. Thanks for bringing that up. Well, I'm only... Uh, you know, we went out of business. No, but the, you, had the, you had that for years. Listen, 24 years. You had that for a long Listen, time. Listen, it, it served me well, and I miss it. I miss it so much. But such is times like times are hard yeah, now, yeah. as we'll say. Yeah. Our trade is really struggling. Um, and then you, then you, then, tell me about the golf courses then. How does that so, come about? So, I don't know how it came about. Oh, I know how it came about. I was cooking at someone's house, uh, a private job, yeah. and one of the guests said, um, oh, Tony, have you ever been to so-and-so, uh, the, the Rygate Heath Golf Club? Uh, the deal was, if I looked after the catering for the golf club, I'd get the restaurant Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Ah. And that's how it started. And then I got a bit of a reputation, um, and other golf clubs started knocking on the door. So now I, I look after Rygate Heath, uh, Copthorne Golf Club, and I've just taken on uh, Woodcote Park, which is in Coulston. So what else have we got in here? You've just warmed everything up through yeah. there. Yeah, so just kind of heating through. So these are, these are going to have some really nice earthy flavours. Do you want some seasoning in, in this? Do you want yes, please. Salt. Salt and pepper. Do you want pepper. some black pepper in it? Yes, please. Do you want please, a bit of basil yeah. in it as well? Or no, no. Sure you want some? No? No. That looks so pretty. So, yeah, so it's nice colours, but they're flavoured. A bit of lemon nice in it as well? No, no, no. No, just do as I tell you and you'll be fine. <laughs> it's all right. Yeah. <laughs> Have with that? Just pour it into there. There you go. Right. So, that's on your key. Yeah. And we're going to start building this now. You need, you need, like, 15 chefs in your kitchen to do this dish, yeah? Not really. And a pair of tweezers. And, and yeah, a pair oh, of no, tweezers. I don't, I don't, <laughs> firepower back. He's, he's getting it just got, bang, he's got bang, bang, bang. He's got tweezers. <laughs> <laughs> so we're just going to kind of build up all these lovely... I didn't need to fire back on that one. He was, uh, yeah. Yeah, but I don't own any tweezers. So we're just going to put some... Of these lovely little flavours. The courgette I just put in there, obviously, because it helps with the colour. We're going to put some Parmesan shavings on here. Nice. Like that. I'm not going to use that, to be honest. Hey? No, because Mark doesn't like it. I, 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 banned, no. I banned them 20 years ago. Yeah, you banned them. Like it. 20 years ago. Yeah, 20 years ago. So we're just going to. Literally put a bit of pond. Micro hose. Yeah. Band. <laughs> <laughs> They're not foraged, you see. They're uh... exactly. It's not natural, is it? It's not foraged. I'm not putting it on. Honestly. <laughs> that, that that. Oh, buying those bloody ready-made things. That's so last year. <laughs> what is and this you've got this here? This here is just some um, yellow mustard seeds, and they just with the earthiness, and then just that gnocchi. It start. It brings it all together. I think. Because gnocchi normally comes in the tomato sauce, and I think that's quite boring. Do you want some basil? Like is he allowed, a little to, bit of basil. Are you allowed to put basil yeah, on there? You can put it? some basil on basil there. Basil, right? Yeah. Yeah, we can have basil on that, there. That's, that's Let's move this out of the way, like that. That's a looking <laughs> veggie dish. Yeah. A few bits of basil on it. Yeah. Do you want some olive oil? You can put some olive oil on there for Just me. Just put some olive please. oil on there. And then, yesterday, James, I made a loaf of bread for you <coughs> while I was at home. So, what is some this? Tomato, tomato picatra, is and it? basil. And I did put a little bit of um, curry paste in there. That's not very Italian. Right. But it, it just it, it works so well with the bread. So there we go. But give us the name of this dish then. This is uh, oh, yeah. pumpkin gnocchi with roasted beetroots. That's what it is. This is that. Tony, everybody. Hey. Thank you. Without the micro hose. Go on then, chef. There we go. Go on, appetit. <laughs> Oh. I'm into that without micro herbs. No micro herbs. Can I taste this? Yeah. Can I taste a little bit of this bread then? Because yeah, I've just munched the gnocchi yeah, that I've yeah, got yeah, over go here. For it. Go for it. There we go. Mm. Dive into this. Mm. A little That's bit nice with the curry spices. Nice yeah, with the. Just a tiny. It just. 
I mix it with the olive oil. We can serve that with a kedgeri, can we? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And how would you do? How would you, you see you blanch them six yeah, times? Yeah, six times. It just gets rid of the, the bitterness to them, oh. um, and then you sit them in. So I put so quite, a, really quite well, a lot of like mustard it. in there, but it's because you're just drizzling it on. You it lifts it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Love it. I mean, that dressing is lovely as well. Great. There we have it. Tony Thank Turbin, you. everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, you're going to stick around for the final cook as well. Yeah, I'm absolutely. cooking at the yeah, end of the show yeah. as well. And we've got time for one more final course. So join us after the break. We're going to be cooking the ultimate mac and cheese with some of our bro smokies in them for my guest, JB Gill. I'll see you after the break. Welcome back, sadly, to the last part of the show. Oh. Uh, there, but I'm back in the kitchen with JB and all my guests. Yay! Uh, but I thought for a final dish, I thought I'd do a twist on one of your favourites, yes. mac and cheese. Oh, Who just love one. mac and oh. cheese, eh? Oh, I love mac it. and cheese. You don't like mac and cheese? Do you uh, not? Really? <laughs> Blame your mother. Blame your mother? Blame your mother. Honestly, what? hated it. Hated it as yeah, a kid. Yeah, hated it in what reason? It was lumpy mac and cheese? What, what? Yeah, all the above. Yeah, yeah, but this is not... This lumpy, is, this is... horrible. Just minging. All right, it's a good start yeah. to this bit. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. right, so, so we're going to improve right, it. I like them. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. Right, gonna, bro, smoking. Well, these are going to go into it as well. So I, I need your help for this as well. Okay. I thought when we got a guest like this, I thought with somebody of your culinary expertise, because <laughs> yeah. you're a bit of a master in the kitchen, well, master like in the kitchen, yeah. all that. I thought we'd do this. Now, have you ever seen these before? These these are our bro smokies. You written about these in the book. Yeah, well. many years ago, my uh, British regional food, and I mean it, it's yeah, they're artisan and it's. I think there's only about two or three, um, Producers. maybe not even that. They they cook them over all sort of whiskey barrels traditionally, don't they? Yeah, they sort of seem, it's, it's quite an interesting thing when you actually usually on the and beach and that kind of stuff, yeah. isn't they? They put the yeah. old sort of uh, damp sort of uh, sacks over it and then yeah, and there's nothing modern about that when you when you visit. Yeah, I mean, there's no proper old. A school. lot of modern day smokers they sort of push a button and. Come back the next day and it, you know, it's done. Take it out. Yeah. <laughs> it just happens to be done. No. So that's so we've got the macaroni in there. Meanwhile, we're going to make an onion inclusive. If I can get you to then grate the cheese, yeah, it's not some glamorous side. job, is it really? But <laughs> there's the cheese. You can grate all that. That's going to go in there as that's well. All right. So, so we talked earlier about this, this the, the property show that you're doing as well. Yes. We just recap on this because you know to get a commission like that, to get you know 80, 90 odd shows like this. I mean, it's amazing anyway, but it's testament to the, the, just the, the simplicity of the programme. Those people who haven't watched it, tell us about it. Well, I mean, ultimately, myself, Amanda Lamb and Sam Pink can go and visit Holiday Homes and we'll give them a, a rating out of 10. So that's based on location, on value for money, on facilities. Yeah. And w long story short, one <laughs> of us will win on the day. But the great thing about it is that you can go and visit all of the different Holiday Homes. So if you like them, you can go and check them out. So these day. are all for rented Holiday Homes? Yes. That you get. But this is global as well. Yeah, I mean, we did, I think, 20% 20, 20 of the episodes in the UK, but then we went to Croatia, the Canaries, Italy. Italy is one of the places that I've never really been to, never got to... Obviously, had Italian food here in the UK, but never, you know, been over there to, to sample it, and it's unbelievable. Well, you need to chat to this chap, because this chap, chap you've got fishing all over... I mean, you've been travelling all over the world. Iceland yeah, so, and all those yeah, places. Yeah, Iceland, Cuba. Uh, we went to Louisiana oh, wow. early last year, which yeah. was fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. Fishing for redfish. Don't suppose you get a chance to go to Russia that much anymore. No. No. <laughs> we took it off our list. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, well, we're moving on, moving on. Interesting. Right. Interesting. Right, we've just got a nice little sauce over here, which I'm just going to whisk this all together. Yeah. So this is your, your, your classic sort of bechamel. Now, I always do a bechamel with a onion clouté, which is this sort of uh, onion with bay leaf and a little bit of clove, but I always think that's the classic way to do it. Mm, yeah, yeah. And then we're just going to add, this is, this is how you get it. And, and then the we're going to add the cheese, well. yeah. then enrich it with the cream and everything else, and then pop in the macaronis. Right, now, chuck that in there as well. Goodness me. There we go. Beautifully grated, I must say. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you very well <laughs> <done. Tony. laughs> Forget about what I was doing with the sauce and everything else. <laughs> there we go. Right, so we leave the cheese to one side. Now, I need you to get the, the abro smokies out of the oven. Yeah. There we go. Ready so, now? Yeah, there's a tea towel there. And then we can start to sort of break these apart because these are going to go into our sort of our macaroni cheese at the end of it. So we're going to just mix this all together like that. <coughs> and these, go, but like you're saying, Matt, there's, there's there's no real substitute with these, are they? They they just they are what they are. And I think a lot of people you don't see them for sale much either. I think a lot of people don't know what to do with them. Yeah, well, you're not like you know. They're a bit like kippers, but I, I, I prefer them to kippers. 
Yeah. Yeah, you can break yeah, you break some apart and you can have a little taste of those. Mm. We're just gonna put, put some bits and pieces in a bowl as well. But what I want you to do is you, you take these, we just break these apart, just break them all apart like that. Like... And I think this is something that, you know, could easily disappear, couldn't it? You know. Mm. It's one of those things if we, yeah, it's it's such a fragile thing. And we used to have them all the time, but I think it's one of those things that, you know, as as customers and whether you're working as a chef or anybody watching this or you know, we've got to keep buying this sort of stuff as well because it, it's an artisan produce that just... There's nothing else like it. You know, I'd just have these on their own. I'd forget G sauce. <laughs> but the t you could put a little bit of mustard with this if you wanted to. Now I'm going to have a little seasoning of this. And then we'll take our... bit of macaroni. Pop that in and start to mix that together because we're not far off now to then put, start this, get it ready to put in the oven. So take this, mix this all together. So this is your classic mac and cheese, or I would do it. But then we'll mix. What's the difference? Is what we've got in here with the abro smoky. So a bit of this over the top. So with your doing your 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 J, JLS sort of uh, <laughs> revival, yeah, is it something that it's kind of I suppose it's kind of open ended. It you could continue that and you could go again. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, we've got no plans at the minute, but um, but yeah, I mean, my daughter probably is one of our biggest fans now, and she's been on at me. She's like, Daddy, when can we go to the O2? I'm like, We can go anytime you like. She's like no, 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 you need to be singing. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I'll have to speak to the boys and see what we can do. How old is she? She's four. <laughs> yeah. Because, yeah, look, look, we're just going to take our macar macaroni cheese like this now and fill up each pot like this. You know this is going to be good. Um, see, I feel under pressure now, Alicia's just yeah, said just it do a small yeah. one. rubbish to start with. <laughs> <laughs> Move that to one side. And then, look, we've got our... I brought smokies over more. the top. Do you need more? Uh, got a look. No, I think we'll be all right. Put that over the top, like that. Maybe a little bit more. Go on. Yeah. Waste not, want not. We'll just put a few bits more on, and I'm going to do it with a nice little salad to go with it. There you go. Just break them all apart like that. What do you reckon, Matt? That'll do. Beautiful. That'll do. You see? That'll do. A little bit of cheese over the top. And then I'm going to put a little bit of mozzarella with it as well. Yeah, good. Nice. Just put a little bit of mozzarella, just a few bits of that. This is from just up the road, Laverstoke. Yeah, that's just up the road. Now, if you can open the oven door, because this is still hot, we then just pop... No, top one. Top <coughs> one. We're going to pop this straight under the grill. That's it. Because this is still hot. You, if you're doing this at home, you want these to go cold, mm. obviously just put them in a hot oven. But I'll just... Move those to one side. Meanwhile, we're just concentrating on our little bit of salad over here. Classic French dressing. Our simple little French dressing. We've got a little bowl over here. So you can make this. A little bit of mustard. So you get a spoon out of the little yep. pot. So a touch of mustard. Mix that together. One part vinegar. Three parts veg oil. Measured. <laughs> Measured, yeah. whisk it together. So there you have your little French dressing. Stick it in a jar, stick JB on it, and you <laughs> sell, it in a, sell it in a farmer's market. <laughs> Jobs are good. Done, done. We're just going to take our little bit of shallot, like this. Okay. That's going to go in there. And then we've just got some mixed leaves all in there as well. And that's going to go in. So, of all the places you've been to before, uh, so far, you think Italy is the shining light for you? Italy and Croatia. Croatia stole my heart a little bit. See, I heard about Croatia. Have yeah, you been to I've Croatia? Been. Only once. Uh, I've yeah. been loads of times. I've <coughs> never been. Is it, is it is, is spectacular, then, isn't it? I don't know. I was sat on the back of an aircraft carrying about 93. <laughs> <laughs> this is when you were working. <laughs> Just tell, tell before you were before you were a forager, tell, them, tell them everybody what you used oh, to do. Yeah, so I used to be an aircraft engineer. Oh, wow. And I used to on an aircraft carrier. On an aircraft, right, so we were in Adriatic, <laughs> pop, bobbing up and down every day, and there was one night and it was beautiful, and I was sat at the back of aircraft carrier and there was all these shooting stars, and I was making... Anyway, I'd run out of wishes, there was that many. 
And my mate come along, she goes, what are you doing? I says, I'm making wishes. She goes, nah, she goes, that's anti-aircraft missile fire. <laughs> 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 wow. <laughs> right, so we've got our little bit of salad over here. There you go. And then, right, if you can get a little bit of this dressing, yeah. spoon it over. Tip it all on. Go on. So on you know, he's telling you, go on. Dress it. <laughs> dress them. Do you want a dressing, don't you? You yeah. want it, do you? I like to dress it, you know? Whoa, 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 whoa. There we go. See? Oh, that's good. Okay. See, I was going to put it in a fancy bowl, but you're not getting it. You're getting it that. That's how we're getting it. I just think, you know, go on, I'll put it in a fancy bowl. The director's telling me to put it in a fancy bowl, so I'm putting yeah. it in a fancy <laughs> bowl. Told, yeah, yeah it's, I'm getting told in my ear, don't leave it like that. <laughs> You're not at home. I am at home. <laughs> this, this technically, where you are currently, is called unnecessary washing up. <laughs> all right? Oh, maybe I'm not. <laughs> yeah. Look, and now I can't fit it all in the damn bowl. Look, that. There you go. <laughs> right. And then in here, we've got our, our bro smoky, which better be good, because we've got quite a tough customer at the end over there. Uh -huh. Smells right, isn't it? It's smelling amazing. Yeah, yeah it smells it's great. great. It smells all right. It's on fire. You can hear it, and it's, it sounds good. It sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Oh, yeah, that looks top. Ooh. It looks lovely, doesn't it? <laughs> Our bro smoky mac and cheese. My job in my house is done. Done. <laughs> <laughs> Right, I'm going to then just put salad on that one. Bon appetit. They're down there. Salad on that one. I'd say thank you, thank you. Well... <laughs> tea mark. There just you pretend. go. Yeah. Oh, yeah, pretend, Salad yeah. on yours, Chief. You can dive in, JB, dive in. Tell me what you think. Can you always edit it? On there. Thank Have you. a taste. Have a taste. Mm. Is, it, is it better than Mother's? It's looking like it. I reckon it will be. Delicious. Got a nod here. Delicious. I think Amazing. That, yeah, the smokies I mean, really give it a new dimension. Yeah, they are brought smokies. Lovely. There you go. Well, that's it. That's all we've got time for today. Massive thank you to all my guests. Uh, Peter Shabika, uh, Alicia Basic, Tony Tobin, Mark Hicks, and, of course, JB Gill. <laughs> we'll see you back here at the same time next Saturday morning. We're joined by more top chefs, Sally Aby, Sat Baines will be here, and tenor Alfie Bow will be joining as well. And then till then, take care. Stay safe. Thanks for watching, everybody. Bye for now.